Uh, hello, and welcome back to lunch for our last session in this room for the day for the conference. <laughs> we have so many sessions. Um, this session, Constructing Peripherality, uh, welcome. So our first speaker is Sean Clanky. He is Professor of Applied Linguistics at Otaro University of Commerce in Northern Japan. Uh, a Hokkaido resident for, did I get that right? Okay. Uh, for 18 years, he writes extensively about life in Hokkaido. He is the co-author of more than 30 text and self-study books for English language learners, and is the founder and host of the Otaro University of Commerce English Lecture Series. <clears throat> He's a frequent speaker at conferences in unusual locations, as many of us are, <laughs> and attended the Island Dynamics Conference in Greenland last year. So, take it away, Sean. All right. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you today about Hokkaido. And here we have a kind of map. Uh, this is where Sapporo is. Uh, Sapporo has 1.9 million people. Uh, the university I belong to is right in this bay right here, and that's Otaru, uh, right there. Uh, the main cities, Asaikawa is up here in the center, uh, Hakodate down here to the south, and a smaller one over here, right here. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about Hokkaido and the remoteness in the Japanese context. Um, what I hope to achieve in this, if you haven't read my abstract, is focus on Japan's northernmost main island, its largest prefecture. Uh, we'll look at historical, cultural, geographic, and linguistic things that contribute to Hokkaido as remote and other from the rest of Japan. Uh, these include from the government, which uh, until recently had a cabinet, cabinet level position devoted to handling issues of Hokkaido, uh, along with Okinawa, to centralized population of Tokyo and the other three main islands, and the view that the island is cold, distant, and backwards, which is often what we hear. Uh, it will be argued here that this perception of remoteness is also maintained by the public in Hokkaido. They see themselves as distant from the rest of Japan. And uh, these will be compared to the reality found in the demographic and geographic data to attempt to come to some understanding of Hokkaido, which today is as accessible as any other part of Japan but which psychologically remains at a distance from the rest of Japan. So that's what we're going to focus on today. And I am a linguist, by the way. Uh, I'm not a specialist on this subject, so if I miss some of the terminology, please forgive me. Uh, so here's Japan. And up here in this nice fuchsia color, which should be lavender, since lavender is one of our main products, uh, is Hokkaido. Here are the Kuriels. Uh, the Southern Kuriles, which are disputed territory, Russia holds those right now. And for Adam, that's where you looked over right there. Uh, and Okinawa off to the south, which is not geographically here, it's down here. And I should mention that 40 kilometers north of here, this is where Sakhalin Island starts, right here. And you go far away from A little bit of demographic data for you. Hokkaido's population, roughly 5.38 million uh, from the Hokkaido data website. Uh, that is in a country with a population of roughly 128 million. Japan is experiencing a declining population overall. And as we'll see in a little bit, Hokkaido's population is leading the way. Sorry. Uh, Sapporo's population, Sapporo is the main city in Hokkaido, its population is 1.95 million. It would surprise you that it's 1.95 million. It is a very quiet place, <coughs> Sapporo is. Uh, Hokkaido, as a prefecture, is first in land size. It's roughly 20% of the country in terms of land size, but it's seventh in population at uh, 5.3 million. Size-wise, roughly 32,000 square miles. Most of it is farmland and uninhabited wilderness. Okay. Lots of wilderness, lots of bears, none of them white. Uh, but they do wander into our neighborhoods, even in South Jose. No wander around off the mountains. Uh, as I mentioned, most of it is farmland. Uh, the main agricultural products there, uh, potatoes, onions, rice, um, Onions are a big surprise. Uh, but when you drive down the road on the way from Sapporo to Ferrado, I mean, they will be 
three to four stories high in containers all the way down the road. Um, soybeans as well, we have those. The other main uh, industry, of course, is fishing. And we have fishing all sides, everything from oysters and scallops to um, sorry, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and uh, a variety of other fish, crabs, uh, a lot of the crab the trade is between Russia and Japan, uh, in spite of not having a very good relationship between the two countries. Uh, trade is quite important up in Hokkaido. Uh, Otaru, where I am from, was built on herring, the herring industry. Uh, when you come into the city, there is a sort of mountain pass that comes over and goes down the trains underneath it, the road goes underneath it. Uh, the herring magnets mansion is up at the top of it. It's now a hotel at about 800 dollars a night. Uh, but it has a beautiful view of the bay and the sea, and you can see where, how the industry was built there. Um, Otaru historically was a Bank of Japan branch, uh, sort of the equivalent of a Federal Reserve branch. And this is amazing considering how quiet and small this island is in terms of population. Uh, it is not that way today. Otaru has 160,000 people. It, is, it has uh, been suffering for a very long time. Um, it has a tourist area down below, down near the port, uh, because a lot of the trade came up through the canals. And we still have one or two of the canals which are open and beautiful, and that's where the tourists go. But if they come up between that area and the university to the main strip, three out of the four businesses along the strip are boarded up and shut again. Uh, hopefully that's beginning to change because, as you'll see a little bit later, tourism is uh, coming back in large part thanks to the Chinese, uh, and Otaru is booming at the moment, so we're hopeful. Uh, Japan's self-sufficiency rate is 39%, must import most of its food. Hokkaido is completely different, it's over 200%. Uh, we're very, very fortunate, we get the best of everything, uh, food-wise, and best seafood and best agriculture. somewhat different in Hokkaido from the rest of Japan. Uh, when Hokkaido, when the uh, government after the Meiji restoration started uh, to develop Hokkaido, they started with the Hokkaido Kaitakushi Development Commission. That ran until 1882. Then the Hokkaido Agency, which ran until 1947-04. Uh, the Hokkaido Development Agency ran until 2000. This was a, a cabinet level position, uh, sometimes referred to as the Minister for Hokkaido and Okay, so you can see in all of this that Hokkaido is being treated as somewhat different from the rest of the country. Uh, and it still is today. It's been sort of pulled in. It's the Hokkaido Regional De Development Bureau now and is part of the Minister Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport, and Tourism. And that was from 2001. The other group on the island is the Ainu. Okay, and the Ainu, I'm not going to say very much about the Ainu today. <coughs> But they were finally recognized as an indigenous people in 2008. Okay? This was after the Japanese had pretty much destroyed most of the culture and most of everything that I had. Uh, yeah, I'll touch on that a bit more. This is, um, this is what's called a docho. This was the old um, prefectural government building in Sapporo. It's now a big tourist attraction. Quite beautiful. I took that last month, I think. Yes. Uh, perceptions of Hokkaido. Okay, Peter Davidson, uh, the idea of North, writes uh, In Japan, the North Island, Hokkaido, is today the location of the exceptions to the completeness of the cultural system of the heavily de developed South Island, Honshu, both ethnically, it is a home of the Ainu people, and in terms of remote remoteness, the quiet cities, the long snows. I don't like this quote very much, except for that last part right there. Okay, uh, because it sort of makes it look like that that um, Japan has two main islands, or they're actually four main islands. And it's also Shikoku and Kyushu. Um, 
here is one from uh, Anne B. Irish, uh, in Hokkaido, a history of ethnic transition and development. Um, other Japanese see Hokkaido as remote, spacious, and distinct. Japanese often think of Hokkaido as the frontier. It has been called Japan's Wild West. Some have suggested that it is Japan's Alaska. I've heard Japan's Siberia. <coughs> For all kinds of things like this. And of course, we are at the end of Siberia, so that is also possible. And these perceptions of Hokkaido as a remote lingering, there are lots of reasons for why this is, or we'll get to it in just a second. Uh, the perceptions of Hokkaido as remote are largely remnants of an earlier time when transportation took longer, when the extremes in the weather were more pronounced, and when there were simply fewer. Uh, Japanese perceptions of Hokkaido, snow. Okay, we have snow here. Um, not nearly enough. <laughs> uh, I took this recently. Uh, this is very close to where I live. Um, during one of the storms, this was the result of it. We had 96 centimeters in 18 hours. Okay, and that is unusual, but not so unusual that we don't expect it. Okay, this is the front wheel well of my car, and it has more than a meter of snow on top of it. It took hours to dig out of that to be able to go down the mountain. Okay, uh, so this is a big deal for people. In the rest of Japan, you can have no snow and reasonably temperate weather, be about 10 degrees, 8 degrees. And then they'll see the, the news and they'll see this. And this just puts a mile of distance between them and us. Okay. And there's a second reason for this. Japanese houses are very poorly insulated. Even in Hokkaido, they're very poorly insulated. Okay. So everything feels cold. So if you're in a cold house in Tokyo and you see this, oh no, we're not going to do this. This is a the second perception, does anyone know what the second perception of Hokkaido is? <laughs> no, no, Mount Fuji is the Shizu of the picture of South Tokyo. It's rural. Yes, the Chinese speaker are paying attention to my slides. <laughs> uh, it's rural, yes. Um, here we have Furano. Have you heard of Furano? Okay, Furano is where is our lavender area. Okay, it's where they do lavender fields up the sides of the mountains. It's purple, it's beautiful. Um, this is the town down below, and of course we have the mountains up here. Uh, these mountains will have snow almost all year. Almost. Okay. Uh, you can see it in the crevices, still even in July and August. Uh, this is one of my favorite cafes in Toronto, and this is what people think of. And often when Japanese come up, this is where they go in the summertime. So it fits their image. And the third thing, of course, is the onion. Okay. Uh, this is from the, um, the Yanyu village uh, at Koganeyu, which is south of where I live in Sapporo. It's on the south side of Sapporo. Uh, it's a preserved village. No one is living there. There's a museum attached to it, a Yanyu museum. And it, uh, for the few tourists who make it down there on their way to the onsens, uh, they get a you of a couple of houses. These are Chisei, they're called Chisei in the Ainu, and some of the other structures that the Ainu villages used to have. Okay, there's another Ainu village south of Sapporo, about two hours in the town of Shiroi, and it's a much larger village, and there are dance performances and things like that, but it's not a operating village, it's a, basically a tourist village. Okay, uh, many of the Ainu have so assimilated that they're hardly distinguishable from other Japanese now. Uh, you'll sometimes see it in the features, in the facial features and things. But um, as for there being actual operating Ainu villages, not much, unfortunately. But this idea that Hokkaido is the home of the Ainu, is of course taught throughout Japan, and Japanese students grow up learning that the Ainu were there, the, they show them the maps, the maps have all Ainu names on them, 
And this is really the only area that is considered a new area, even though the Ainu descended down into Honshu uh, fairly far down. Okay. And we know that from place name evidence and some of the other uh, evidence left behind. Okay. They were also up in uh, Sakhalin and also up the Kuros up to Kamchatka. Uh, I mentioned Hokkaido place names. Uh, one of the big things that makes Hokkaido stand out from the rest of Japan is the place names. Japanese place names uh, in Hokkaido are what are called Ateji. Okay? Ateji are transliterations uh, of sounds placed over the Ainu word. So placing Japanese sounds over the Ainu word to create a new name. Uh, and this has both good effects and bad effects. But the names, the Hokkaido place names, are notoriously difficult for Japanese people to pronounce. Okay, because Japanese people, of course, read the, con the, the characters, happiness, luck, and they see it that way. Because <coughs> the name that's underneath it has a completely different meaning. And so sometimes the pronunciations don't come off right. Uh, a large proportion, large meaning, Unless you have a new town, every name in Hokkaido is pretty much like a name. Okay. And this magnifies the difference from the rest of Japan. In certain cases, we see something that we talked about uh, when we were at the Greenland conference, is that they'll place a somewhat happy name over an unhappy place to attract people to come. Okay, remember Greenland? Okay, it's not green. They want people to come. We have a place called Kofu which is uh, basically means happiness uh, from the two characters for happy and luck. And it is along the end of a train line, a very small train line, in the middle of nowhere with mountains in front of you. And they wanted people to go there, and so they gave it the name Kofuku, okay? which is not a naive name, it's a fully Japanese word. We have another one I drive to on the way to work. It's called Zenibako. It's right at the edge of the bay, and it means coin box. In other words, come here for the money. And there's really nothing there. It's just a, a stopover on the way to Otaru. Uh, even the tourists don't stop there. But this is Kofuku Station, and people put their wishes, especially boyfriends and girlfriends who are thinking about marriage, will come here and they'll put, um, they'll get their ticket and they'll write some message and they'll stick it on the wall. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples of the United names. Okay. Uh, Sapporo, Sapporo Pet means vast dry river. Um, Otaru, which means a small vessel or a small like, wine barrel. Uh, Otaru or Nai, Nai means river, river running through the sandy beach. Japanese people today don't understand that Nai means river in Ainu, so they'll say Otaru River, they'll say Otaru Nai River, Otaru Nai Kawa, which means Otaru River River. Uh, leaving for Tokyo, Hokkaido's population has seen a drop, 31,000 people in 2014, with one unfortunate town experiencing five births to 87 deaths. That's not good. Uh, overall decline of population, 271,000 in Japan. Hokkaido accounted for 8.5% of that, the largest of the 47 prefectures, while Tokyo gained, of course. Well, we see this. I see this with my students all the time. They want to go to Tokyo. They don't want to stay in Otaru. And they don't want to be entrepreneurs in Otaru or in Hokkaido. They don't want to be entrepreneurs at all. They want to go to Tokyo and work for a large company. The contrast. We've got a couple minutes left. Uh, look at this. Sapporo Chitose, Tokyo Haneda. 29,000 flights annually. 82 flights going down, 81 flights coming back per day. It's one of the three busiest routes in the world. Okay. We just got the Hokkaido Shinkansen. This is a beautiful Hokkaido Shinkansen that comes from, uh, from Tokyo. It enters at Hakodate. It'll be another 20 years before it gets to Sapporo. But it's here. And we've had a recent boom in the past decade of foreign tourists. Tourism has quadrupled over the past three years, mainly coming in from China. We just opened a brand new terminal, international terminal. It's already over capacity. Things are changing quickly. Now factors changing in Hokkaido, global warming, 
This is a sori. Okay? Uh, we call it sama in Japanese. These are disappearing. I used to be able to buy one for 99 yen, less than a dollar. Now they're three times as much. Instead, we're catching yellow jack tuna, buri, which were not a normal fish to catch in the waters off Hokkaido. The waters are warming. Okay. And in the ice drift, which comes down the Sea of Okotsuka on the right side of Hokkaido, which should look like this, but in recent years has looked more like this. Okay, we see news reports about it all the time. And as soon as I wrote that, a thing came in the news on the front page of the newspaper showing that the ice had come down earliest in 15 years. So sometimes you put it in your presentation and you fix reality. Okay, there's also a new law that's coming up as well. That they're talking about. If global warming continues, Uh, the biggest fear for Hokkaido residents, for my students, I ask them this all the time, the biggest fear, cockroaches from Honshu. There are cockroaches in Hokkaido, it's just my students have never seen one. They're there, but uh, that's what they're concerned about. It's amazing. Um, conclusions. These days, Hokkaido is no longer the remote frontier of Japan it once was. Transportation and infrastructure in the island have made it more hospitable. <coughs> World warming has a role in this as well, but in the Japanese mind, Hokkaido remains remote, far away, cold, covered in snow. Japanese territory, but not quite the same as the rest of the country. The number one desired destination for a holiday in Japan, but also the least popular choice for job transfers. As a resident of Hokkaido for 18 years, I've seen its transient nature with expat friends coming and going and an exodus of my students to Tokyo. Uh, it's become my home and will probably be so for the rest of my career. Um, 